Okay, uh, welcome everybody uh, to today's, to today's uh, forum on uh, trade uh, and investment policy, which is organized by the Seattle to Brussels network. Um, uh, my name is Martin Konechny, I'm the coordinator of the Seattle to Brussels network and I'm very pleased to have you all here to this uh, forum here today where we will discuss uh, what is wrong with the current trade and investment regime how it is shaping our world um, and reinforcing um, the power of big corporations. Um, I'm, and we will, of course, also discuss uh, how to change that, uh, which is a key thing for us as uh, social movements um, to alter the world and uh, change the trade and investment regime in a way that uh, we can implement all the policies that we want in all the fields we care about. Um, I'm very pleased to have here today uh, to my from my side, far right, from far right, but from your perspective, obviously, the far left, uh, Luciana Giotto, uh, who's working uh, with TNI, the Transnational Institute. She's a professor for uh, international political economy based in Argentina. Uh, she's also active at, with uh, Attack Argentina, and she's also the coordinator of the Better Without Free Trade Agreement, uh, Latin America Better Without Free Trade Agreement Network, uh, which fights uh, uh, bilateral and other free trade agreements in uh, Latin America. Uh, to my right, I have uh, Lucia, uh, Lucia Parcena, from, also from TNI, from the Transnational Institute, who specializes on research in uh, the investments, investor state dispute settlement, and in particular on the Energy Charter Treaty, um, treaty that is, we'll hear more about, and that is one of the key uh, elements that blocks the energy transition that we so urgently need. And she has been also in working on trade. Uh, she has been also working on trade and investment for many years uh, before uh, in Spain with Ecologistas in Acción and uh, leading the fight against TTIP and other free trade agreements that the EU tried but failed to uh, implement. To my left, uh, I welcome uh, Nick Dirden. Uh, he's director of, um, of Global Justice Now, uh, which is also the uh, British uh, chapter of uh, Attack. Um, he was also formerly with Born Want um, and is currently writing a book on ph pharmaceutical companies and how they exploit our health. And she's also been working quite a long time on trade and investment policies and also to, um, helped us defeat the TTIP agreement. And not yet announced on the wall here, but also very pleased to have you here, uh, Thomas Köller, who is active with the... Um, uh, AG Welthandel in, uh, and WTO within the German Attack Network and is currently focusing on the fight against CETA, the trade agreement between the EU and Canada that we still hope uh, to stop. Um, yeah, so welcome everybody. We'll now have a first round on the panel and I would like to start uh, with uh, Nick to give, him, give us a little bit of an overview on why it is so important that we talk about trade and uh, change the current trade uh, regime. There we are. Is that working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, nice to be here. So, I, yeah, I'm going to explain why, as activists on the left in the movement, we should care about trade. So, afterwards, you can go out and tell everybody else at the conference uh, what I say, and next time they will um, be in here with us. Uh, first, of, first thing to say is that trade today, trade agreements, trade deals, trade rules, really are very little to do with the 19th century version of free trade. Right? So 100 years ago, we talked about free trade, and we were talking about lowering tariffs, lowering the taxes on, on international trade, essentially. Now, whatever you think about tariffs, um, it, it's really not very central to the, to the trade system today. Tariffs are extremely low all around the world. So trade policy has become much, much bigger. Really, I like to say trade policy is, is for the most part the rules of the global economy. The rules of globalization are, are, are what we call trade policy today. And, and that's really happened particularly since the mid-1990s, since the creation of the World Trade Organization. Um, you've come to see a form of trade rule that really embeds corporate power, embeds the power of capital right at its center. And so today, when we talk about trade rules, we're talking, you can't talk about trade rules without talking about the power of capital and the power of corporations in the world. And the power of capital to do 
what it wants, when it wants, where it wants. And if that makes inequality in the world worse, if that makes poverty worse, so be it. You know, if that means burning the planet and shoving the cost onto other parts of the world, onto future generations, so be it. In the end, we're told, it will be good for all of us. Uh, take your medicine um, and, and you will end up with a better world. Now, the linchpin of this system really is the World Trade Organization, but actually, there are thousands of deals that are signed outside the World Trade Organization, trade and investment agreements that also carry the weight of international law. And that's really important because unlike all the stuff we care about, human rights laws, climate laws, whatever, trade and investment agreements are very enforceable. They're enforceable with sanctions at an international level, so they're really important. Now, I want to give you just three examples of what modern trade rules are about, three, exa three different perspectives of, of, of things that are included in modern trade deals, so you can begin to get an idea of, of, of just how far into society this, that they reach. So, first one is regulation. Modern trade deals are far more about regulation than they are about tariffs. You see, if I'm trying to export something to you, um, the fact that you have different regulations from me is a big hassle, right? It's going to cost me money, and I don't want that. They're a pain. So the best thing is if we try to harmonize regulations between our countries. Um, but of course, harmonizing tends to mean lowering, forcing down to the lowest, um, the lowest standard of the, of the partners who are, who are doing the agreement. And of course, the problem for all of us is that regulations weren't invented to make the lives of exporters difficult. They were invented for all sorts of other reasons that we campaigned and we thought were important. So protecting our food standards, protecting animal welfare, protecting our health services, uh, making our medicines safe, and on and on and on. All the regulations that you know, we all, we all um, campaign for and try and promote. The idea that these should just be kind of um, traded away uh, in, a, in an international trade negotiation uh, is, is, is really quite obscene. And I think people in Europe particularly saw this with TTIP, where we all came to understand uh, what chlorine chickens were, this way that Americans produce um, chickens with um, a chlorine type uh, wash, which basically means the chickens can be kept in really atrocious uh, conditions. Um, but under a trade deal between the European Union and the United States, the idea was that you, you, you effectively say, well, you're, you're more or less producing to our standard, so those chickens can be imported for the first time into European markets. And of course, what effect will that have, even if the trade agreement itself does not say we are allowed in Europe to produce chickens this way, over time, our farmers have no choice but to say, I must be able to produce to a lower standard, or I can't compete with these imports. And in that way, you create this kind of race to the bottom. Now, chlorine chickens is just one example. There's so many different regulations that can be affected by trade deals. And I think the fact for us as Democrats um, that you can do all of this behind closed doors in a secret negotiation and inflict it on society without a democratic debate is particularly pernicious. And I think one of the reasons that we managed to, in the end, kick out uh, 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 TTIP. Second example. Intellectual property. I've been working for the last two and a half years on COVID vaccines. COVID vaccines were very unequally distributed around the world. While we in Europe were getting our third or fourth doses, many countries didn't even have enough for the first dose for their health workers, never mind anyone else. Terrible inequality. And at the heart of that inequality was not just that rich countries were hoarding vaccines, they were, but there was another problem, which is that we weren't producing enough for everybody in the world. And we weren't producing enough because the knowledge, the recipes, the, in, the right to produce, the intellectual property behind those medicines was in the hands of five corporations. Right, so the head of Pfizer, the head of Moderna, were able to decide who produces, how many are produced, who gets to buy, and at what price. Corporate executives get to make those decisions in the middle of a pandemic. And that's because of a so-called trade agreement called TRIPS, passed in the mid-90s at the World Trade Organization, at the urging of pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer, no surprise, which said everywhere in the world needs to accept US-style intellectual property uh, provision, which is like 20 years minimum um, applies to um, my right to have a monopoly over this technology. 
Now, this massively changed the way trade works because for developing world countries, right, the, the, the main benefit of trade was often, I get to see what you've made and copy it. Right? Essentially, that's how China developed. That's how Korea developed. That's how any, to be honest, that's how Britain developed. It's how America developed. It's how all of our countries have developed. No one's developed in any other way. So the idea that you stop them doing that, you prevent that kind of technology transfer and turn those countries into renters, essentially, of your technology, massively changes power dynamics in the world. It massively shifts power to the rich and to the north and allows them to hoard monopolies and it promotes monopoly capitalism. And so in the pandemic, you saw that we have these companies that own the right to produce vaccines, even though they not created them in the first place, they just owned the intellectual property for various reasons, meant they could hoard knowledge and artificially constrain supply. Now, that doesn't sound like a trade rule, but it is a trade rule um, in the global economy. Um, and that problem for COVID vaccines is going to be a problem for climate technologies. It's going to be a problem for um, IT um, how we take on the power of big tech, it's right at the core of monopoly capitalism. So third thing, third and final thing I want to I want to talk about is investment. So investment is really important, it's often overlooked, but investment chapters, investment agreements um, are really about giving money itself or capital protection and freedom to do what it wants, especially protection from government regulation and control. And actually Globalization was always far more about the freedom of capital than it was increasing trade flows. This was much more important to the globalization project. It's also extremely colonial in its origins. So it's one of the ways that the old imperial powers here in Europe and uh, the United States, of course, maintained control over the world after the Second World War because it was often our countries who had the corporations and elites that were investing or exploiting, if you want to look at it in a different way, um, other parts of the world, and they wanted to make sure that investment was protected against governments that were bound to come to power and say, hang on a minute, that's our resource. Why are you just allowed to take that? We want to nationalize it, or we want to regulate the way you're allowed to work in our economy. And I think the thing that best demonstrates it, I'm not going to talk about it a lot because um, Lucia is going to talk about it more, is, is at the heart of invest a lot of investment agreements, this thing called ISDS this corporate court system, which offers legal protection. It's a, it's a parallel legal system, which is only open to big business and big investors from abroad. An arbitration system which carries the weight of international law and which a, trans, a foreign transnational corporation can take a legal case if they believe they've been treated unfairly. And being treated unfairly is a very wide definition, as we're going to, as we're going to hear. It was actually invented by uh, fossil fuel and financial corporate executives back in the 50s, and they were quite explicit. You know, we've got all these newly um, uh, new countries emerging from colonialism. How are we going to protect what we've been extracting through imperialism when those countries are free? You know, okay, my government said, yeah, we can send in the gunboats and we can overthrow governments like we did in Iran, the democratically elected government of Iran in the 50s, but, you know, ultimately it's quite expensive and it's quite, you know, there is a political cost to that. Far better that we create a legal system which simply allows us to do it, to hand that power over um, to corporations. And so you see, uh, Lucia's gonna give some examples of how this works, but um, climate examples, but it isn't just climate change. So the government of Australia was sued by Philip Morris Tobacco, makes Marlboro cigarettes, for daring to put cigarettes in plain packaging as a, as a health measure. And Philip Morris said, well, that's not fair. We expected to make a certain amount of money when we came to Australia. How can we do that? If, and they sued them. You know? And Slovenia nationalized its health insurance system. South Africa tried to promote black economic empowerment post-apartheid. Canada refused to give a pharmaceutical company an extension of its monopoly. All led to ISDS cases. And even if the firms don't win, obviously this has a chilling effect on what they're likely to do. So look, I'm going to end... Um, by, by just saying, I think uh, this is all very uh, grim. Um, I actually think we are in an interesting time now where the political support for this kind of system is waning in our own societies. And even people in the establishment are beginning to look and say, is this a good idea? The example I like to give, you remember the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal because it was too big to go through the canal, right? 
because we've made ships so big. Our just-in-time supply chains are utter dependence upon these ridiculously long supply chains where we can push costs and push regulation down as much as possible means that we literally don't have the ability to get stuff across the world fast enough. So we've made ships too big to go through the canals they need to go through. So a ship gets stuck for several weeks and global trade comes to a halt. Right? This is crazy. This is unsustainable. This is the system eating itself. And I think that's the reason why you begin to see, even in the United States now, an administration that isn't very interested in signing new trade deals. Right, that's a big turning point. Uh, my own government is interested in signing trade deals, uh, and I think that says something because, as you will know, they are an extremely liberalizing, deregulating government, and they see it as a way of doing that. But more generally, I think there is a big backlash against it, and I think that's an important um, moment for us to say, yes, we need it to be different. But as internationalists, we don't believe in simply pulling up the drawbridge and saying we don't want anything to do with the rest of the world, we make everything ourselves. Um, we need to find a different form of trading system which is fairer, which creates, uh, which creates equality um, and which helps us deal with the terrible climate crisis that we're in. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, yeah, now you already talked about uh, ISDS and how it um, hinders our governments from taking the action it should take. Uh, Lucia, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how uh, this is plays out in the field of climate, in particular with the so-called Energy Charter Treaty? Yeah, this is, yeah okay. Yeah, um, so indeed I'm going to talk uh, a bit more into detail into one specific agreement which is the Energy Charter Treaty. I don't know if any of you have heard of this or it sounds a bit familiar. I see some hands that are saying yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the, the name of the forum is trade, but trade is so big that it's about like very many, many, many things as Nick was saying, but in TNI, in my institute, we have specialized a bit more into ISES, which is everything that has to do with investment protection. And in fact, I can say that I think this has given us um, the good opportunity to, to emphasize in one specific mechanism that corporations use in this free trade agreement to show the, the horrors of the system. No? So it has, it has been very helpful and very useful to, you know, to concentrate into this specific mechanisms, although trade is much, much broader than what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so the Energy Charger Treaty is, in fact, not a new agreement. It's actually an agreement that was designed in the 90s and signed in the 1991. Um, some countries joined in a bit later, so I will steal the drawing of Luciana. <laughs> But you see in that ladder, it would fit into the first level of the ladder, no? So it was signed in the 90s when it was like a moment of proliferation of bilateral investment treaties. After the failure of the WTO agreement, uh, there was a new um, strategy to, so we failed in the WTO, but we still need these agreements to, you know, be able to, um, make a free market for our corporations to invest in a safe <laughs> spaces for them. So then they started to uh, design and create many, 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 many bilateral investment agreements. But in the 90s, there was an explosion of agreements. And not only bilateral investment treaties, which is between two countries, but also multi-party or multilateral agreements. The first one being NAFTA. Um, which is the one between the USA, Canada, and Mexico. But then the ACT was also designed in that moment, uh, which was signed, uh, well, now it has like 53 uh, member parties. So it's actually one of the biggest um, multilateral agreement. And the specificity of this treaty is that it's um, energy specific related. So it really is the only agreement that um, talks uh, about yeah, how to do design rules um, on energy specific investments. No, and we're gonna go a bit more into detail later what that means. Um, so as I said, yeah, it's uh, the only agreement, multilateral agreement on energy. And yes, it, it was designed in the 90s when it was a moment of the fall of the Berlin Wall. No, so the the former Soviet countries uh, were now in the like it, it was not the same blocks anymore. So the EU had to somehow make sure that their investments were still going to be safe in these countries and that they would also uh, have like um, flow of um, gas and, and carbon and everything coming from, from ex-former Soviet countries. So that was a bit like the motive of doing this, 
But in fact, who was in the negotiation tables were not only politicians, but they're also um, like energy companies, and especially European companies, so Shell, Exxon, were part of the negotiations of the, of the content of the treaty. So of course, what they were looking for was to design a contract, a private contract that countries would join, and that had a lot of benefits for them. Um, so it was really, you can say it's a treaty designed for and by um, big energy corporations and transnational corporations specifically. No? So 30 years later, after the, the signing of the agreement, we start seeing um, the first cases of ISDS. And this is a bit how we got to work into the, into the ECT because we have been following ISDS in different agreements and in different cases, but then we started seeing like there was like um, many, many, many cases coming in only from one specific agreement. And many of these cases were related to, um, were initiated by fossil fuel companies, no? So then we started to look uh, a bit more into depth and what is this agreement and, you know, like why did we sign this agreement and why have we never heard about this agreement before? So 30 years later, we come to realize that this is one of the most obsolete treaties, like all these old um, treaties that we actually have today, which is actually in contradiction right now with the newest um, law investment reforms by the EU. So the new agreements cannot contain things that this agreement has. No, um, and not only that, but you know, like it was a, an agreement which was sponsored by the EU very much. No, like a EU specific agreement, but. Now we see that there's like a boomerang effect because the treaty is now, um, you know, like many of these lawsuits are coming from European countries against other European countries, no? So this is like something that I'm sure that when they signed this agreement, they didn't expect this effect to happen. But this can happen because the rules are so broad and so vague that nobody can predict what can actually happen when you sign this type of agreement, right? So it's like, as I said, it's like a, like a private uh, contract that you have no? with, uh, between the different countries with the difference that you cannot renegotiate anything that's in the contract. But once you sign it, you are like giving like a free check to whichever investor or investment comes from any of these 53 uh, parties that are part of the agreement. No? So imagine like instead of you negotiating like a like in a bilateral way with a, with a country and saying like, okay, I, I will allow investments to come from your country, but only in these conditions. So you cannot put any condition anymore because you have actually signed away everything, no? Um, so so, the, so this uh, treaty has many rules to protect investments. Of course, it has no obligations for fossil fuel investors. It only has rights, as they call it, but it's basically privileges that gives uh, um, fossil fuel investors. And the way to enforce these rules is precisely what Nick was saying, um, by using these um, private tribunals, so ISDS. So ISDS comes from um, Investment State Dispute Settlement, which is like a, a way to, to solve uh, possible conflicts that arise between an investor and a country. And this comes from private law, like from commercial law, which is used a lot between like when there's like a conflict between two companies then instead of going to national judges and opening like a process in the public um, system like national domestic tribunals they decide to go in this private uh, way of solving um, the conflict but you can say that's okay if it's about two companies because they're using their money like it's two private companies solving however they want their issues but then they they kind of like export that idea um, for state and investors so then it's like using the same system, but not only between private companies, but between a state, so that's all of our money, uh, and a private company. And not only all, all of our money, because the way to compensate the company is always monetary, but not only it's our money, but it's also getting more and more into public interest issues. So you see like when you, like already the name, no? Like already saying that an investor and a state are like at the same level, it's already a bit strange, no? Like in, if you study law, no? Like why, why is that? So, so anyway, yeah, so the investor is the only one that's allowed to initiate um, a case and the state can only defend itself. And in most cases we have been investigating uh, since a long time in TNI, we come to realize that these type of tribunals are completely biased 
because they are there to defend the investor's protection. So they usually don't take into account other issues, like for example, um, environmental issues or public health issues. So they're really there to defend the, the investor. So in more than half of the cases worldwide, the results of this, I think it's 70%, I don't know, but a lot of percentage, the result is in favor of the investor. So it's already a system that has been, it, it, it is receiving a lot of criticisms, as Nick was also saying, in particular, since we also initiated like campaigns like TTIP, one of the big issues in TTIP was precisely that it had this system incorporated. And the, the, the European Court of Justice even recognized that this system was anti-constitutional. It was like against European law, because how could there be a system that goes, you know, like it, over, it overlaps? No, yeah, it goes above national law. Like investors don't have to first go to national courts. They can go directly to this system. So you have all these issues, no? Like they can go directly to this um, system. The, usually the arbitrators who are the, law, the judges who decide are completely biased in favor of the investor. And it's completely unpredictable because it's case by case law. So you have no idea what kind of jurisdiction they're using. It's exit uh, rules and it's very hard to know what the interpretation is going to be by the, by the arbitrators. So you have like, yeah, like this system which Right now, it makes no sense. And I mean, this is of course debatable, but this system was invented in the 60s, no? When there was like a decolonization of many countries and of course, Western capital said, oh yes, they can decolonize, but we have to make sure that our investments are going to be protected. So they invented this system to make sure that their investments would always be protected. But then that logic is now applying also to European um, countries and, and, and everything, no? So in the way, and when we, sorry, I'm, already late when when we dispute these topics you always get like a reply of like saying from investors like they say yeah but we need to have a, a system that protects our investments so then it's like what so is our national tribunals not fair enough for for you that you have to use like a special treatment in this investment courts so anyway so this system has been disputed and criticized by academics lawyers etc but the system is still in the Energy Charter Treaty, and even though the treaty has been undergoing a renegotiation or a modernization, this system has not been touched at all. So the final uh, version of the new text of the ECD still keeps um, ISDS. So, so that's, a, uh, that's a big problem. And anyway, so right now, the Energy Charter Treaty is an is a investment treaty that has most ISDS cases only through this one treaty. So it's 143 cases to now. And most of them are related to decarbonization policies. And that's what we're seeing now with a very wor worrisome eye, right? Um, and, but there could be many more cases because a recent study by Investigate um, Europe, which is like an ind independent journalist group, they discovered that, I mean, they discovered, they put some numbers out saying that only in Europe there are around 345 billion euros of fossil fuel infrastructure that are protected under the Energy Charter Treaty. So that means that we could potentially face uh, billions and billions of million, um, yeah, like new lawsuits if we continue to be inside this agreement. And one of the cases, just to give you an example of what cases we're talking about, um, is um, Uniper and RWE, which are German companies, that um, sued the Netherlands because the Netherlands passed um, a law that said that they would um, stop using um, electricity that comes from, yeah, like they would start decarbonizing their electricity system in 2030. So then RWE and Uniper said that that regulation was going against their private investments because they would not have as much benefits as they, as they would have if that regulation was not there, no? So they sued um, the Netherlands. Although, I don't know if you've heard this news, but Uniper, which was bailed out by the German government, put a, as one part of the, of the conditions that they would have to drop the case. No? But that's like an anecdotal example that happened, but it doesn't mean that it's going to happen in all the other cases. There's another case by Rockhopper, which is a British, a British uh, company that sued Italy after Italy uh, retired the license of exploration, like mining exploration in the sea, in the Adriatic Sea. 
So what I want to raise here, the point is that we're going to be seeing more and more of these cases, the more regulations there are going to be that are going to go against fossil fuel um, usage, no? or, or companies or investors, which is where we have to go as, you know, as if we want to keep the 1.5 uh, degrees. So there's going to be a clash and conflict um, on like climate friendly policies and investment agreements. Um, and the Energy Charger Treaty is going to be the, the harshest one, especially for European countries, because they're the ones that are being more sued um, up to now. So as I said, and I'm going to finish with this, the ECT uh, went through a modernization process because, of course, they realized that they couldn't keep this agreement as it was 30 years ago. Like, we've been having so many advancements in so many other agreements, but the ECT hasn't changed a comma. So they decided to open a process and to renegotiate and modernize parts of the treaty. Um, and we just uh, had, there's some campaigners here that can <laughs> explain more, but we just had like the text in August, so this August, so we're still in August. <laughs> So, like, basically, some weeks ago, we had, like, the final text of the modernized treaty, and we already knew that it wasn't going to be the best um, outcome, because ISS was still there, but uh, the EU, they decided to include, like, a clause that said, we will, you know, slowly start, stop protecting fossil fuel investments in the ECT, only for those countries that decide to do so, so it's not an obligation, it's a flexible proposal, and it will start in 10 years, so 10 more years of protecting fossil fuels. And this is something that the members decided by themselves. Nobody told them it had to be 10 years. So again, yeah, like is it enough like to keep protecting fossil fuels for 10 years? We know that it's not good timing because of the climate urgency. So, so yeah, so as we as campaigners, we are definitely saying that the modernized text is still bad as it was before. Uh, but the good news is that we're still in time to stop this agreement. <laughs> so, so, yeah, the modernization text is out, but it hasn't been signed yet. It has to be uh, first like approved in the EU Council, and the member countries have to approve, um, sign the modernized text. And there are already countries that have said that they will not um, approve the text, they have said it, we don't know if it's going to be real or not, but for example, Spain, which is where I'm from, um, the Ministry of Transi Ecological Transition said that the ECT is very bad for the climate, it's going to protect fossil fuels, and that she's not going to sign the agreement. Um, the German government, um, in its new poli trade policy, included some requisites also about the modernized ECT, and they expressed that they would also you know, think about not signing the agreement. And the Netherlands also approved a motion in the parliament saying that they would also not sign the modernized agreement. So yes, there is hope. And this, I have to say, that has only been possible because we, social movements and trade unions, um, civil organizations, think tanks, have been able to make all this information public. That's, remember, like, uh, Susan George used to tell this story, like, to kill the TTIP, you, you had to be like a vampire, no? Like, when you shed light to it, then it would die, no? And that's a bit like how these negotiations go, because they're all so secretly that nobody knows anything about them. So it's when we start campaigning and showing the horrors about it, is that people start rethinking, and also politicians, because most of the times they have no idea what they're doing. Um, and yeah, so anyway, ECT is only one of 3,000 BITs, so Luciana will talk to us a bit more about other agreements. Um, and yeah, that's my time. Thank you. You've got your own microphone, and yeah, now Luciana will tell us a bit more hello, about, hello. in particular, the North-South relations, the relations between the EU and South America, and yeah, how okay. they are problematic. Okay, okay, this is working, yes, okay. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our trade forum. Uh, it's interesting. I was I was looking at. I will start somewhere else first. Um, then I will go to that point. Um, I was thinking that it's good that you're here. I'm happy you're here, but it's like it's very few of us, right, for the trade forum. And I was thinking that it's interesting that uh, we keep putting the trade issues as trade issues. Nick already started with that, saying 
trade is not about trade, actually. So we're, what are we talking about now? The, all the things that go beyond the borders of the state and that uh, corporations are very eager to guarantee in all these agreements because they guarantee their gain. So this is trade about. So it should be many more of us discussing trade because trade has to do with every day, and that's why we put on the, on the, on the blackboard, like, like in school, um, it's a very small diagram to show how these trade agreements have been evol evolving these past 25 years. How? Uh, Lucia talked about the ECT, so the Energy Charter Treaty. Uh, we can do that? Oh, that's good. Okay, I like this. Um, Lucia talked about the Energy Charter Treaty. We place at the same moment the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. We place the BITS, the Bilateral Investment Treaties, and the ECT in the 90s. So that is like, the, like what the United States said at that time. Well, we're generating the new law for all the globe, right? With this, after, after uh, the, the end of the Soviet Union, now this is how international trade would look like. We will have the WTO here also in the first step, but it's not an agreement, it's much more than that. So we have that. Then we have like a second step. The ALCA, the Free Trade Area of the Americas, FTAA, was a second stage, why? Because if we compare the text, yes, yeah, some nerds like us do that. We actually read the text. We have to read the texts. So when we read the text, we see how they start getting more complex and, and, and start including more uh, different issues that they were not in NAFTA. Uh, and then when we see the third stage, we're already like past 2010. We have the Trans-Pacific Partnership and we have the TTIP that you know so much about. I know more of the TPP because some of Latin American countries are inside that Trans-Pacific Partnership. The UK will soon be in the Trans-Pacific Partnership too. Well, this is very strange. I didn't, I didn't think, I thought I had studied geography and I didn't see the UK on the Pacific, but who knows? Maybe it just moved. It could be, it's an island after all. Uh, who knows? Uh, so why? What do we have in the TPP and the TTIP besides too many P's and T's? What we have in this third stage is more complex, especially these disciplines that are related to what states can do bureaucratically, administratively, and also what laws can these states pass. So we're looking at these, these instruments have become a very powerful octopus that cover all of the issues related to corporate agenda. So they want to have everything there. In the TPP and the TTIP, we found these chapters of 25, 30 pages of regulatory coherence, the regulatory issues. So states can't uh, move as they moved before. These uh, agreements have become locks, yes? They have become locks to state action. They have, been, they have become locks to privatization processes. So imagine if we are talking about these agreements having 30 chapters, for example, the TPP has 30 chapters. Of the 30 chapters, only five chapters are trade-related issues. Only five chapters. So what about the, uh, the other 25 chapters? Well, we have investment, we have, we have services, we have financial services, we have e-commerce, we have property, intellectual property rights, we have investment, and we have regulatory coherence, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so we have a lot of chapters that have to do with what states can actually do. This is trade, and that is why I'm so worried that it's just us. We should be able, as activists, to explain this in a way. I think we do, but people keep thinking that trade is something for, for uh, economists or for lawyers, and we try to explain the overall impacts of these treaties. And that's when I want to go to my second point, which is how do we analyze these impacts? First, if we see at NAFTA time, yeah, we go to NAFTA time, 1993, they were negotiating, 1994, it started working, so it, it, it entered into force. January the 1st, 1994, the day the Zapatistas went out of the, of the, of the jungle and said, Shabasta. They were talking to that also, huh? They were resisting already to that. But if we see 
the text and we see the activists in Mexico, in Canada, in the US, they didn't really know what would happen, right? Because the text was there, they could imagine the impacts, but we still didn't know, this was new. But now we have almost 30 years, we have plus 25 years of impacts that we can analyze. So we should be analyzing the, those impacts. We have been doing that in Latin America. We, are, we have been doing that and we still have a long way to go for you to know. We are still trying to gather more brains to analyze this because we need the technical knowledge in order to analyze economical impacts, in order to analyze how laws have changed because of the FTAs. And also you can say, well, but why did the, the countries sign these agreements? I mean, didn't they know? Were they traitors? Were they selling the country? What were they doing? What were they thinking about? Well, in the case of Latin America, uh, there were mainly two things that I can bring as two possible explanations. One is that Latin American countries were, and still are, like Argentina itself, in big debt crisis. So if we see how the negotiations of the bilateral investment treaties were done in 1991, 1992, 93, 94, for example, when massively all Latin American countries entered into the, into the um, investment treaties, there was a lot of pressure from, from for example, we have that uh, in documents from the pressure from the German government, for example, to pay the debt Argentina had in, at that moment, 1991, with uh, some of the hedge funds like Hermes, the, the group Hermes, uh, in Germany. So we see that there is a connection, a very strong connection between the debt crisis in Latin America and the signing of these bids. But also a second point, there were a lot of promises made associated with that. What still strikes me is that we see today the, negotiator, the negotiators, negotiators doing exactly the same promises that they did 30 years ago and people buy it. I mean, people in general, but also like small and medium enterprises. I mean, you should know exactly how it has impacted in Colombia, how this has impacted in Peru, in Chile how the trade agreements have impacted industrial uh, mechanisms in each country, so you can know the impacts on your own country too. Um, some of these promises, what were the promises, for example? Increase of employment. So we had Salinas de Gortari, the president of Mexico, signing the NAFTA, and he said this phrase. He said, with this agreement, my fellow Mexicans won't have to migrate to the US anymore. I'm quoting 1993. Yeah, we, we saw that, right? We saw that happen with NAFTA. Yeah, NAFTA made magic there. We have seen actually all of Central America entering the FTAs with the United States, and we still see the big migration wave going up, and how CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, and NAFTA itself have disarmed industrial situations in Central America, and they have become especially exporters of uh, raw materials. And that's the second point. The second promise was, if you sign the trade agreements, you will have export di diversification. So you will be able to export other products uh, than the ones that you do today. When we see what happened after, for example, the Chile EU, the Mexico EU, if we see after the Colombia or Peru EU with the US also, we see that actually the opposite happened. What we see is that what has been enhanced is the export of raw materials. So if you see the whole of Latin America with trade agreements, you see that what countries export are th the main products of export to the EU, for example, are the products that are in the sea. So you have shrimps, fish, salmon, in, in the case of Chile, for example, tuna, canned tuna, canned fish, then you have the progress of the jungle, the fruits, the coffee, the cacao, no? Co cocoa it would be. Uh, then you have uh, flowers, then you have uh, also in the soil we have minerals, we have uh, lithium now, we have gold, we have oil of course and gas, Colombia exports oil and gas to the, the European Union. Uh, and also we have uh, the products of the fields, soy, uh, meat, yeah? So these are the, if you see every Latin American country, you will see this 
are the products that Latin American countries export to the EU, for example. And what does the EU export to countries in the region, in Latin America? They export planes, vessels, motors, cars, motor cars, uh, helicopters, vaccines, medicines, antibiotics, uh, chemicals in general. So what we see is like there is like a very little imbalance there, right? In the trade uh, equi equilibrium between the two, the two regions. This is a big problem because it's something that we have seen, and, and I'm going to finish with this, but what we're seeing is that actually the free trade agreements for the, the whole of the, of the global south, I'm bringing, of course, the, the case of Latin America, which is what I know of better, but uh, what we see is that the free trade agreements have enhanced or have deepened extractivism in the south. And one of the tendencies that we are seeing now is that in in uh, this way of having the energy transition in Europe, the new agreements or the old agreements made new, like the modernization with Chile and, and Mexico, what we see is that what they, what they are actually doing is that they guarantee access for corporations in Europe to lithium, for example, or nickel, or all the products associated with the fabrication of the batteries for electric cars. And that is called, in Europe, energy transition, which is super. But the thing is that the European Union is using the trade mechanism, so this is what we see. The European Union is using the trade mechanism to guarantee access to Volkswagen, to Mercedes-Benz, for example, access to the lithium they need for the energy transition. What does this bring? Well, it brings that all the consequences are being left there in these sacrifice zones, for example, in the Andes. And so, can we talk about, and th this is a question, I think I have the answer, but this is a question we have to make. Can we talk about a new Green Deal? Can we talk about energy transition with free trade agreements? I think not. That's why the trade agenda is much more than trade, and we should be discussing this when we discuss transitions to a post-capitalist uh, um, society because there are no real changes with these free trade agreements that have come to actually change our possibilities to change policies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luciana. And now, Thomas, uh, please tell us what, what's at stake with CETA at the moment and why is it so important still? Ich glaube nur in den Mund halten, dann probier mal. Hallo, hallo. Ja, ja ich mache es in Deutsch. Uh, hallo. I'm talking in German. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the speakers before me. I'm very happy it got stressed so much that trade policy is more than just trade. Those were great speeches about what Attac here in Germany is also thinking about. I've been part of it for six years, but the working groups have started out right after Attac was founded here in Germany. Which is why, Nick, you brought up three aspects, regulation, intellectual property rights, and investment protection. I would also take in services. Maybe you didn't talk about it because it's basically over already and it has been privatized and open to the market. Anyways, six or seven years ago, it started out with TTAP and we put a spotlight on that. And that's when I joined. And ever since the European Parliament has agreed in the beginning of 2017, and when Trump at about the same time became president, well, Trump was also at least rhetorical against free trade. He criticized NAFTA. And one important thing is that the treaty after NAFTA doesn't have the investor protection anymore. Uh, back then, 
we were told, well, you are cooperating with Trump if you're against uh, TTIP. And, well, the public wasn't that interested in it anymore. Journalists weren't that interested anymore. And we kept waiting for the German Constitutional Court to make a decision. But um, we were expecting the decision to happen sooner, and now it has only happened um, in March or February of this year. That's how long the topic has basically been asleep. And also, politics said, well, we're just going to wait. Because when it comes to CETA, it's a mixed trade treaty. where the each member state has a part in the ratification process. And that's different from other trade treaties where they have been decided upon without the participation of each member state. So now it's starting up again that CETA is back on the agenda. And the uh, CDU has six or seven times uh, already formulated a law and brought it into parliament uh, that is supposed to um, bring this treaty uh, into existence. And now we have a green liberal coalition where the Green Party is now saying we are the ones bringing it into Parliament, um, facing it head on, and we want to reach something with this. We want to tackle the investi investation protection that uh, Lucia has been talking about. We want to defuse it. The Green Party has also said that in the end we will only agree if a declaration is made that the uh, investment protection will be diffused. So what they want to say is it is supposed to not be able to be abused anymore. This argument that investors are being treated unfair is is a problem. It can be seen very broad, and the Green Party now want to, to make it more tight and say they will only agree if there will be such a declaration. And if such a declaration exists that will uh, make the Green Party content, then the second and third reading of the CETA agreement will happen and will be decided upon in the German parliament, which would make Germany another state that has ratified the CETA agreement. A few countries are still missing, for example, Belgium of France. So CETA would not be finally ratified, but for us, this is the starting point um, for our fight against it. So that is why it's relevant today. But what is important to us now, and what we think, is that right now we have the situation of the Russia's war in the Ukraine. And I'm assuming that the rest of Europe is also noticing that Putin has been lowering gas supply. So now we have to ask ourselves, um, it's an insecure situation. Will we have enough gas in the winter for, for example, heat our apartments? I myself have been thinking about, will I have to spend the whole winter just in my kitchen? And that's the situation we have right now. 
And the political situation also is that Russia, we want to stop Russia, and that's the argument that is, has been made. And many people probably think, well, leave me alone with these problems about CETA. We have to work with the Canadians about this now. They are our friends. Uh, they have a wonderful democracy. And if we don't cooperate with them, with who? Our green economy minister has even traveled to Qatar and made agreements there. So obviously, we will have to be able to make agreements with Canada. I think that is the discourse right now. And I happen to know that there's an environmental organization named Urgewald in Germany. And what they do is they show which corporations invest in fossil fuels so that investors who want to be sustainable can keep clear of these corporations. And that is the idea to take away the financing of fossil fuel. They are doing great things. And I happen to know that within that frame of that project, they also have a list of 25 projects worldwide, uh, which are especially scandalous because either they are extremely bad for the climate or they hurt indigenous rights uh, there's different categories, and within these 25 categories, 25 projects, there's 50% of them in, <laughs> sorry, 5% is in Canada, 6% is in the US, um, among others, a pipeline project for the project of Canadian oil or gas. Which is why I think what we should do right now is to show this problem with the narrative that Canada is such an unproblematic partner to have because all these projects are hurting the rights of indigenous people And the one thing is whether we can do crisis politics in the short term. That is understandable in the situation we have right now because it's very insecure where the gas will come from in the winter. But crisis politics is the one thing. And long term legal security that is made possible to a treaty like this is something entirely else. One thing is the investment protection that we already heard about. It's a clear case where over decades these investments are being protected. But the starting point is at the moment, CETA is already being in use preliminary, especially the investment protection and the normal duties of liberal liberalizing ourselves, um, having to let the goods in, are already hindering politics in saying, well, we've made it through winter, and now maybe we don't actually want the Canadian oil anymore. Canadian tar oil, which many of you may have heard about already. Um, it's an area bigger than the UK. It used to have a special kind of old forest, which was uh, 
um, holding twice the amount of carbon that the Brazilian rainforest did, and that oil is beneath the f trees, so you have to cut them down to get to the oil. So all that CO2 has been released into the atmosphere. And then there's a the problem. If you want to get the oil out of the ground and just by burning that oil, so much emissions are being emitted that the climate would go up by 0 0.4 degrees, which would be enough to put us over the 1.5 goal. And then there's the other aspect that within this method of getting the oil out of the ground, there's another thing that is being emitted, I think it's methane. So if you see these three aspects together, and only that one project with the tar oil, one of five Canadian projects, <laughs> then even just that is already unbearable if we want to give the climate any kind of chance. And as I said, such treaties are supposed to make for long-term legal security and it cannot be uh, to do that with a country that is doing projects like that. And one last thing, from the 19th to the 24th September, there's going to be an action week from the federal action um, network. Um, there's a stand outside um, where you can find information about that. Um, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Um, we heard now a lot of things that are wrong uh, with our current uh, trade and investment regime. And before I want to pass the floor to you and the audience to ask questions, make short statements, um, I just wanted to hear from the people on the panel uh, very briefly, like what what is the alternative to the way uh, we're doing trade policy nowadays, and what are the, the victories and successes that we already have won in the last uh, years? I think there's quite a bit we can account for, and quite a bit we need to still fight for. And yeah, uh, I would ask uh, Nick to start. Okay, so. Almost what we want, I think, is <clears throat> kind of the opposite in some ways of what these trade agreements do. I think we want international cooperation that will allow us to deal with climate change, that will allow us to build decent public services, um, that will encourage us to learn how to regulate capital and regulate corporations and regulate investment. So it works in the public interest. And I don't think that's actually as, you know, uh, utopian as it, as it might sound. I mean, if you look at the creation of the current global trade system after the Second World War. There was a, there was a, the idea behind it was, sure, lower tariffs because we think that will probably help forge full employment and prevent unemployment, and we think it will probably help development, and if it does, do it, and if it doesn't, don't do it, you know? And it was, and there were lots of exceptions, lots of carve-outs, um, and that, like, you know, that was the trade system that existed from the end of the Second World War through to the, um, the 1980s, really. Um, now, I'm not saying that was perfect, but it's interesting that even within modern capitalism, there has been a, a very different way to do, to do trade. I think the other thing you need to look at is, is probably what, what Luciana uh, talked about a little bit, that the terms of trade in basic goods is still um, uh, stacked against the majority of the world in that you know they sell us raw materials and metals, and we sell them expensive process stuff and increasingly services. Um, I don't see how any country is going to be able to develop from that relationship. Like, you're never gonna get rich selling more avocados. So, for me, 
I think the encouragement of, of regional trading systems makes sense. And I think, you know, Luciana, you'll be able to talk more about this, but one of the most exciting things we've seen in the last 25 years was the attempt by the pink tide governments in Latin America to create an alternative trading system which broke that dependency on the old imperial powers, which broke the dependency on the dollar, which was based on solidarity rather than competition. Um, you know, it, it, it was never as developed as we would like it to have been. There were some examples, but I think at least you have some kind of framework there which you could begin to use for countries, particularly in the global south, to think about how they can trade in a fundamentally different way. So this is a question we always get asked. And yeah, I mean, we don't have like alternatives. What is an alternative to the Energy Charger Treaty? Well, I mean, if you look at the Energy Charger Treaty's objective of, um, you know, like having like a sovereignty in, in energy wise, for example, um, that's not going to happen with the Energy Charger Treaty because I mean, at the end, like these big agreements are really only benefiting big transnational like oligopolies like energy transnational oligopolies which are not precisely the ones that redistribute the wealth like among you know like the the national like the countries no so i think like we really first have to acknowledge that to stop um justifying like the existence of of these ftas because it's 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 hard, no? Like sometimes you say like we don't want FTAs, and they immediately think that you're against progress, or I don't know what <laughs> the problem is, no? But but yeah, so I think we have to continue um, first of all, like demythifying um, that dogma that we have that we need disagreements in order to attract investment, in order to grow, because that has already shown in Latin America, and not only Latin America, but the OECD has also put some reports saying that there is no correlation between FTAs and more um, investment, like foreign investment um, in the countries, no? So if that's like the, that's like the nature of these agreements and that's not even happening, then why do we still need these agreements and who is actually benefiting from all this industry? So yeah, so this idea of like, yeah, like, you know, at the end it's actually going against us as citizens, especially in energy because it's, you know, it's benefiting these big transnational corporations who are only getting richer and richer. We saw that since all of us are going like through the, um, major crisis of oil prices etc the oil companies are getting richer and richer so it's benefiting this type of companies they're not redistributing the wealth plus they are eliminating competition because you know like for smaller national investors who invest in energy it's harder to compete um, in the energy sector if they are not a you know if they don't have like these treaties that protect them for example no? so so yeah so an alternative specifically for the ECT it's not an ECT, so it's actually investing more in like infrastructure, no, like national infrastructure. If you want to do an energy transition, we know that this, a sustainable energy transition is not about having big companies again monopolizing the system. So we don't need to, you know, like change the 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 matrix. We need to change the matrix of going to more renewable energy, but we also need to change the suppliers. So it, they cannot still be the same companies who will lead us to this energy transition. And especially renewable energies, it's all about decentralizing the system. So we really need to, you know, like invest into smaller um, projects of uh, renewables. Yes, we do need a lot of investment. We know we do need money, but that's not necessarily attracted by by the ECT, but by having, as I said, no, like infrastructure or, for example, sometimes like like local policies, national laws that actually, you know, um, incentivize investors to to get into the uh, renewable sector. So that's what we would have to invest in and not in these FTAs. And also it's important to acknowledge that all these ISES cases that we have been saying are costing millions and millions of euros and state resources that are diverting that money that could otherwise be spent for an energy transition. No? So we don't have time now to speak about who is actually benefiting from this, but I can tell you that it's not us and it's not like the energy transition that we want. But at the same time, and you know, there's not like we, we do work also like in in having like um, mechanisms to control corporations. Um, for example, like 
like the binding treaty or human rights due diligence, like to be able to, you know, also um, bring access to justice to those communities that have been, um, that have suffered a violation by a transnational corporation. So it's like a, you know, like at the same time that we see that investment law is getting more and more sophisticated with all these agreements that we are seeing, human rights, uh, international law is emptying in content, no? So there's like a complete unbalance there on how we are advancing in this, having like binding regulations, special tribunals for corporations to use, but at the same time in human rights, we have absolutely no advancements. So, so yeah, so we also have, as an alternative, we, you know, we work also for having like more binding regulations for transnational corporations when it comes to environmental or so human rights um, violations, but that's going <laughs> not in the best um, way possible. So yeah, we don't have time to talk more about that, but if you go into our website, you can find a lot of information. The alternative is go to our website. <laughs> uh, in my case, I will say that this is something we have been discussing a lot uh, among the Latin American organizations, always the alternatives, try to understand what alternatives. But first, what we want and what we don't want. No more FTAs. First of all, no more FTAs. None of them. Because all of them are awful. I mean, you cannot put more makeup to it to make it better. You cannot add a chapter on gender and trade, as they have done. For example, in the Canada-Chile Free Trade Agreement or the Argentina-Chile Trade Agreement, they included a five pages chapter on gender and trade and uh, Sebastián Piñera and Justin Trudeau said, this is a very modern free trade agreement because it has a gender chapter. So to try to make the feminist movement like at ease, they included a five pages that says nothing. And so we say no, because that's not the important chapter. The important chapter are the ones that actually give you arbitration or give you the possibility to actually try to break any possibility of the other countries who are trying to industrialize, for example. And it gives you all the access of your transnationals to the country. Go and play, kids, you know? So no to FTAs, first of all. No more bids, no more bilateral investment treaties, any of them. And we want to know exactly, listen to this, this is, I'm going to say something so radical that you'll be, you will be, uh, no, no, yeah, I'm going to say it anyway, but I'm, I'm sure that you won't like it. This is super radical. Um, we want to know the numbers of the impacts of the agreements. This is like a socialist proposal, right? You know the basics, this is like the basics. 25 years of free trade agreements and governments cannot show any good impact of any of these free trade agreements. So we know that we have reason on our side, but we have to show that. We have to engage in technical discussion too. It's awful, it's boring, it's numbers, it's laws and blah. But we have people or we need more people to engage in that discussion we, because we have to give the political discussion with uh, parliamentarians, with uh, policy makers, with the media also, uh, you can see now just an example of how this is so radical. The government in Chile of, of uh, Boric, of Gabriel Boric, only during the campaign he said that maybe he was going to revise the Chile's uh, inclusion in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. And the media was right there on, on him like, oh, this is socialist, they want to, to cut us off the world, they want to, us to not ex import anything, you won't have like the basics to live every day. This was the idea, but the truth is that they don't tell you that Chile imports every day, for example, peas from Canada, peas that any farmer can have in their farm, well, they are imported from the northern country in the Americas to the southern country in the Americas. That is what they, this FTA, so that's no more FTAs, no more bids, and we need audits, commissions like Ecuador did. We need to know and show people how this has been disgraceful for all of us. And from there, then discuss alternatives. But first, my radical proposition is to actually get the numbers straight and, and discuss from there. Thomas, please. Yeah, as a kleine again. Okay, just one small thing to add uh, about the thing with the numbers. 
uh, in our parliamentary debate, one parliamentarian was very proud and he said, uh, with CETA, the gross national product will grow by 10 billion euros, or 12 billion euros even. But that's nothing. Our gross national product, w when we started with CETA, we were we had uh, 17 billion euros. So 12 billion euros, that's nothing. And it's made uh, out to be a, a huge economic success. And that's just one year. So now distribute the effects for the next 15 years, that's less than nothing. So I just, I can agree with much that's been said. Um, I just want to talk about the alternatives. We'll have to come back um, to international law and it has to be it has to serve society and it has to serve human rights just like our national laws do and it has to enable us saving the climate uh, and I think Luciana said all these free trade agreements these bilateral treaties uh, WTO treaties they can be enforced uh, and from a legal perspective they're above human rights even though that's not true but they have the mechanisms to be enforced and that's what we have to end Human rights, saving the climate, have to be our highest priority. And I do believe Nick is right. The world's trade system before the WTO, when um, tariffs were lowered, was different. Freedom regime didn't try to interfere with national politics. You had some leeway and you cooperated, and in other ways you cooperated internationally. For example, you found a solution to save the ozone layer. So in the 70s, we were on the right path. We all contributed to solving the big prob problems humanity has. I think there was 1980, highest court um, and Wilhelm Brandt, former general chancellor, he wanted to support renewable energies. So 40 years ago, if we had started 40 years ago, we wouldn't be where we are today. And another aspect, this freedom regime should find its way into national politics and give leeway to find uh, international cooperation. Another thing in um, international law, there is the term use cogens. Uh, that was new to me too as well. So these are binding international norms. And even countries that form certain treaties among each other have to adhere to these norms. So this concept of use cogens, certain things are like a constitution and the countries cannot uh, put their bilateral agreements over these use cogens. So with this free trade regime ever since the WTO has been founded, what we see is that it's put above the other laws in terms of international law. 
And I think we should work with this concept of use Kogans. And free trade rules cannot be more important. International law has to serve people, has to serve the climate, our society, but not the companies. So it could be an idea that the Paris Agreement should be part of this use Kogans. And let's have a look at CETA and the other treaties. And if we see that these treaties are uh, contradictory to the Paris Agreement, then we'll go to the International Court of Justice and uh, want them annulated. So that's not uh, the best solution, maybe, but it could be a way we should try out. So this is the way we could uh, lead our conversation. That international law is no longer serving the companies, but human interests. That's what it was made to do. So it was made to serve basic human rights. And now it's time to say that we need to reintroduce uh, international lo law back to the needs of society. Thank you so much. Um, now it's the time to discuss before I do that, I also want to take the opportunity, if you liked uh, what uh, Luciana told you, uh, you can hear much more of that tomorrow and the workshop that uh, Luciana and I hold together tomorrow at uh, 10, uh, 10 in the morning uh, on the EU-Mercosur agreement, the uh, agreement between the South American countries of the Mercosur bloc and the European Union that is uh, not ratified yet, not uh, finalized yet, and which we still try to stop. And what it is in it and how we can stop it, you can learn tomorrow morning in the workshop of uh, Luciana and myself. But now I want to give the floor to you. Um, please raise your hand if you have any questions, any statements. I would ask you to go down there um, to the microphone and uh, speak into the microphone. You, of course, very much invited to uh, speak in German or in any other, not any other language, I think French is also okay, uh, <laughs> French or English. Uh, so uh, uh, please, yeah, bitte, uh, then you and then James. Yeah, for the translation. Ich denke, die Argumente, warum die, diese Freihandel I think the arguments why these free treaties uh, are bad. We have known that for years. Other summer academies have talked about that, for example, Paris a few years ago. But the question is, how can we actually achieve something with the arguments? How can we mobilize? You just have to look around. There's only two dozen people in this room. And remember what it was like 2014, 15, with 100,000 people. And big conferences. How did it happen that this question, which is so important for democracy, has, so to speak, vanished from the public, we have lost the public. When the EU, EU agrees on treaties, um, they cannot be reversed. Now, if we achieve it that not all countries ratify, we have a chance, but once all countries have ratified the treaty, then no single country can step out of it anymore, and we have lost. Now, how can we mobilize this pressure from the bottom up, even though apparently the public isn't interested anymore? 
Yeah, thanks a lot for the four excellent contributions. And of course, it's always difficult to think about alternatives, and I'm not here to give any kind of insightful additions. But I think it's two of you, I, I think, refer to the pre-1995 gut period as a kind of a better system. And in many ways, it was better, but I think ultimately that's is that not a very northern, western-centric perspective? Because if you ask Africans yeah, what happened to them in the post-World War II period or other countries in the global south, they didn't benefit from these gut uh, arrangements either. And I think we need to keep that in mind and rather than going back, look for alternatives elsewhere beyond that period. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, James, uh, so, sorry, uh, and then you. Um, and I wanted, uh, should ask you to state first in which language you're talking. To yeah, of course, you're also very much invited to state your name and your organization or whatever you find important for us to know about you. Uh, but for the interpreters, I think it's most important that you know which language you're starting to talk in. I will speak in English. Um, uh, I'm James, I'm from Global Justice Now. Um, and I just wanted to um, maybe emphasize um, some of the uh, victories that we've actually had, because it, uh, Martin even asked about that. Um, and uh, it, it, it's easy to forget. I think, uh, Luciana, you, 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 you mentioned it uh, in passing, but the, the Ecuadorians actually cancelled uh, 17 of their uh, investment treaties. Um, one of the last things that... Um, that Correa did before he was out of office. Um, um, and uh, I mean, that actually raises a question then. You know, he was, that was, that was the last the, part of the, the ebb of the pink tide uh, governments. But now we're seeing with Chile, with Colombia, um, the possibility coming back of, of, of doing things in a different way in, in lots of dimensions. Um, but uh, potentially also in terms of trade, and and and, and particularly um, uh, uh, in Colombia, in, in Chile, um, you know, there's a lot more talk now about um, the problems of extractivism, about uh, needing to move away from a fossil fuel economy, and so on. Um, so maybe that's partly a question for the panel in terms of what what possibilities there are there, um, and particularly you, uh, Luciana. Um, but of course, there's a whole history, and a, a previous speaker mentioned it, you know, we had a mass movement that defeated TTIP, right? These things do come in waves. If you go back far enough, you know, there was NAFTA, there was the, there was the beginning of the ECT, there was an attempt to have a multilateral agreement on investment that we defeated. So um, there, are, there are lots of examples of the ways that, I mean, even now Italy has already left the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, you're seeing the possibility now of other countries leaving it. Um, so uh, it seems like when when the issues do somehow become relevant, when we can make them relevant to the things that people s feel are important in that moment, then we have the possibility of, sp of spreading out beyond the, the, the specialists like ourselves, let's say, um, who follow these things. And I just wanted to also then mention, we, I've got some booklets here which we've been using in the UK to really make the case to the climate movement that, that, uh, that the Energy Charter Treaty and ISDS more generally is an important thing to be working on. Um, so feel free to take one, have a look. Um, we've had some success in doing that, I think, in, in starting to reach out um, to the climate movement and convincing wider layers of people who've been mobilized uh, uh, on, on climate issues that this is an important thing to be working on as well. So uh, do, do help yourself. Ich spreche auf Deutsch. Uh, Thomas Thürmeyer von Goliath. Um, Thomas Thürmeyer von. Um, and I can only say I agree that the victory in the end of the 90s was awesome. You have to imagine Joschka Fischer, other politicians. Um, you could talk to them and they would simply show you secret text. It was an awesome time. 
uh, there are different waves of movements. Occupy used to be super sexy, and now it's not that interesting anymore. But don't lose your courage because of that. In the moment, climate is the most interesting topic for many. Um, it just changes what people are interested in. That's just how it is. But what I want to say is, first of all, right now we have the thematical divides. There's the supply chain law and on the other hand, the treaty policies. But we have not managed in Germany to come together with that. We have two different movements and we have to criticize that. That's the first thing I see. In Germany, there are two distinct groups. There's Kroa, the human rights group, and then there's the treaty group, which is very small. And we have to come back together. We have to bring back the human rights to the treaty discussions. And the second thing is, we have a, had a giant window when it came to the vaccine patents, where in Germany, the German government behaved in a horrible way and just worked on helping the German corporations with their patents for Biontech. <laughs> but you have to see, it brings up certain topics back. The WTO was suddenly in the national news again. And another thing is, we have to see how do we handle debates. So the WTO is back in the debate. How do we treat Amazon? How do we treat Amazon, Google? And we have to start up the debate on data sovereignty again. When I'm looking at the merger between Monsanto and it wasn't about the seeds in the first place, it was about data security and data knowledge. And I'm interested in how will we manage that connection and connect that debate. Let us stay engaged and have a courage. We will manage it again to have big protests like we used to. My name is Isolde and I'm speaking in German. I'm also from the working group World Trade. So I have to tell you, Thomas, we are thinking about the supply chain law and about the human rights, which have less strong mechanisms of being enforced. But I don't really want to um, work on your point of what has happened on 2015, 2016, when trade treaties were the top topic. Uh, we also see that. This way, that within ATTAC there's, and different organizations, there's a lot of knowledge about free trade treaties and knowledge about CETA. And we thought what we have to do once the new coalition has come up now in the German government with all those horrible um, consequences. We have to mobilize now that we have an attack. That's why we put up the info stand outside. And we want to ask you to please contribute, contribute your knowledge, your social relationships, everything that is there, mobilize it against CETA because CETA is a treaty which could lead the way towards new treaty regimes. Uh, what we w would like to propose is to reduce that and reduce it to the questions of the rights of corporations uh, to digitate and to the climate question. And we think it's very important to work together with other organizations to have decent action and then go on to see what potential we have to go on. Um, take it serious, 
come see us at our stand and work out a strategy to broaden this protest. Yeah, my name is Gabriele. My name is Gabriele. I'm from Attack Lübeck. And what has brought me to Attack was that I was so frustrated about the free trade treaties back then. I wanted to answer you because I believe that there's a mechanism that is being used on purpose to realize these treaties, which is to use them preliminary. They have been going on for years. People say, well, it didn't change anything. It's not hurting anyone. What we as citizens are feeling from these treaties, we don't see the dangers, we don't feel the dangers. And that is one of the reasons why many have forgotten, so to speak, about this topic. And, well, all that protest, all that noise, it didn't turn out that bad. That's what I believe is part of it. And then I have a question to Thomas. What is the base of the diffusing that you were talking about earlier? How would you formulate that? What are the possibilities? Couldn't the other side just also um, How can we know that this is going to work in the long term? kind of the work that we all do and and really like where we're going wrong I think and how we're not appealing to like all of the people who were here who cared about capitalism why aren't they here because we're effectively fighting for the same thing um and I know there's obviously other workshops I, I don't think that's it you know entirely entirely our fault um but I mean I think like there's I fully agree with having like this very uh progressive stance on just saying like no more FTAs like that's we, we don't need any FTAs and also with like asking for the the benefits of of these FTAs but like for the UK government sorry for the UK government they don't care they just want to sign trade deals because more like politicians love doing a thing they want to sign a thing you know and I'm kind of trying to then think pragmatically how do we take advantage of that to in the context where we have um, like more plurilateral sort of uh, initiatives at the World Trade Organization, it's really hard to, to get rid of a, a big organization like the WTO. Like we've, we've been trying for a really long time. It's hard. They don't, people don't like to get rid of things because there's some things that are really important in there, like special and differential treatment and common and differentiated responsibilities. So is there, is there a value in proposing something, some sort of plurilateral mechanism whereby you would have countries that sign up to have c between each other sort of collaborative, collective, uh, like progressive policy space where they would agree not to enforce uh, this sort of like hard law upon each other, where they're going to prioritize SDT and the CBDR, um, in addition to sort of having outsider voices saying absolutely no more FTAs. Um, and yeah, I had lots of other their thoughts but that was kind of the main one and like if we were going to propose something that tried to take advantage of that that kind of 
desire to, to sign something new? Is there something that we could create that supersedes international trade law um, itself, whether it's the kind of the... I mean, we've seen some initiatives around that, and there are, in theory, sort of like carve-outs within the WTO uh, principles, but they've never really been successfully applied. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all for your questions and interventions. Um, I would give now the opportunity to everybody on the panel to uh, answer the questions or reflect on the interventions that you had. Uh, I wrote down like a couple of specific questions that some of you might want to answer just to remind ourselves of them. So there was the question about CETA that was directed uh, to Thomas, uh, then the last question by uh, Lear on the plurilateral mechanism. Uh, then it was also the broader but not less important question, how, how can we actually win? How are we able to make our voices and arguments heard? Um, then the question that I think was directed uh, to Luciana on like, what are the prospects in, in terms of uh, trade and investment policy with the, like, the new progressive governments that we see now emerging in uh, Latin America? And also the question of uh, how to connect the struggle for human rights uh, and trade, and also the question on yeah, what what's this new monster that is digital trade, and how can we fight it? Uh, so I would start with you, Thomas, and then go with Nick, Lucia, and Luciana. To end. Please try to keep yourself not too long because yeah, we have 11 long. minutes left. Also, ich fange mal mit. Um so I will start with your question. So that's not a topic here, but um, CETA and all the other new EU treaties, they're being made by committees. And we can talk about this for hours. So in these committees, there are uh, not only the EU partners, but both trade partners. So with CETA, there are Canadians and EU uh, people. With CETA, as well as most other treaties, there are many commissions. But we are still in preliminary application. So investment protection is not being applied at the moment. So certain articles are not valid yet. And these committees, if these articles were active, could already um, start changing and using the investment protecting articles. So according to CETA, the committees could change them, but they are not being applied yet, so that's, they cannot be used yet. So the highest committee, the so-called mixed CETA committee, has the competence to interpret the whole CETA agreement. They can already do that. So this mixed committee can change the regulation about certain things. So everything is still very vague because things can still be changed and we can ask ourselves how far does these do these changements go? Could they um, talk about unfair treatment. It's a very uncertain thing. And finally, it's the arbitrary court that decides. It is bound to the interpretation of the CETA Commission. But CETA also says that this um, arbitration tribunal has to uh, adhere to international law. So these are to be used just like international treaties. So it says that finally the arbitration tribunal 
is um, can decide what the commission has to, uh, said has uh, is not in their competence to actually do but that's uh, too much right now um, I also want to agree with James we have to work together with climate movements uh, two years ago we made a fact sheet and we showed the connected issues financial politics climate politics and I think even the climate movements aren't in a position to say that we just want to instrumentalize them that we want to use the momentum they created um, I think climate movements also have something to gain from our cooperation. Uh, uh, Thomas, I have to interrupt you. We've only got five minutes left. And why people think, you know, the room's not full and therefore, that it, you know, that's sad for, for those of us who like trade. But I actually think we're probably in a stronger position in some ways than we were 20 years ago. The neoliberal trade juggernaut has ground to a halt. Uh, the WTO barely functions. It was, it was, it was, you know, facing an existential crisis this year. It scraped through just about. You know, James mentioned uh, uh, Ecuador, but actually, lots of countries are ripping up investment treaties, including most recently Pakistan. Um, Spain is saying it might withdraw from the ECT. I think this, the future of the ECT is still very much on a on a knife edge, whether it will exist or not. You know, South Africa is blatantly ignoring um, intellectual property on um, medicines in its new experiment. This is really exciting stuff, and I think, you know, maybe we just don't want to call this trade anymore um, because you know unless there's a specific trade deal in front of us that can galvanize and mobilize people th those are important moments but otherwise some of the f some of the fights we're talking about here the activists involved don't conceptualize it as as trade and I think you know America is really interesting the United States is really interesting at the moment where they're talking about you know the whole problem of offshoring and what that's meant to the working class where they're talking about monopolies where they're talking about the problems of big corporations tax dodging I mean neither the Democratic leadership nor the Republicans are of free trade um, at the moment that's an astonishing change from what we saw in the 90s. Not, the re not that we like the Republicans, not that we like some of the anti-trade people, right? But it has changed. And so I think the battle now for us is different. It's defining what comes after the death throes of neoliberalism, because it's not like every form of state intervention we're going to like either. So we have to be clearer, I think, about, about um, what it is that we want. You know, I, I think what gave the anti-globalization movement its definition for me was Latin America. Uh, Latin America has not been in a good place um, for a long time now. Is that changing? I hope it is. And I hope that, again, that might begin to define a new form of internationalism. I think we can have hope um, in, in that. Um, but by and large, I think what we're calling for here is, is a managed form of, of deglobalization. That doesn't mean we're not in favor of internationalism and separating globalization from internationalism is something we've always struggled with, but we need to do. But I do think we have to deglobalize. Um, to, to, to some degree. We need to take control of finance and constrain it and put it back in its box. That's absolutely central. Uh, we need to take on the monopolies. If people want to call that trade or not, I don't really care. Uh, maybe next time we have a trade forum, let's call it something more exciting. Um, but I think, you know, this is a really, I think all of those issues are actually extremely live. And in some ways, there is a lot more hope than there was in the mid 90s. So just quickly, I mean, oh. I hear my voice. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we have to find somehow like the balance between being experts in specific th issues about the FTAs like ISDS, uh, regulatory cooperation, which, as uh, Nick said, has you know gotten us to like good successes. And I would um, I would add that for the first time, the IPCC report acknowledged the the role of FTAs for you know um, climate mitigation. So it's very important that you know like we would have not imagined that 
the most important you know climate review report actually talks also about trade so that's that's because of all the years um, working on this specificities of the trade agreements that has given us also legitimacy um, among policymakers and other organizations, right? But I think we have to find the balance between that part of being very, like observing with the loop, like the specificities of the system, but also trying not to fragment our analysis and connect them with migration, poverty, inequality, wars, um, energy crisis, because that's the broader picture, and that's why we, you know, want the FTAs not to exist. So, you know, we, we followed one strategy, which was going into the specific treaties and the content of it, but I think precisely the challenge to keep mobilizing people and, you know, is, yeah, like not fragmenting our, yeah, the analysis, but I don't think it's only specific to trade, I think it's specific to other um, struggles. So I do agree that, you know, in this type of forums, ideally, we would have people from many different struggles getting together and, you know, realizing like there's so many things going on geopolitically right now. How do we get like one picture out of this? So that's my thought. Okay. Thank you. I use yours. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with what has been said. Um, Especially, I was thinking about Birgit's uh, question. Um, we have lost the public, she said, right? And I was thinking about that. And I was thinking that, for example, in the in the last ESU that I participated it was in Paris in 2014, I think it was. That's when I first met Nick, actually. And I remember that the program there, there were like a lot of workshops on TTIP. That was the moment for for TTIP struggles. Now I come here again, and I see a lot of. Uh, workshops on Ukraine war. Of course, this is what's going on and you're worried about that. But the thing is that the conditions have changed a lot. Nick was saying we have learned a lot in this past 20, 20 years from Seattle battle to now. And actually, the actors that we had in the first World Social Forum when we started discussing ALCA, for example, in Latin America we were discussing ALCA, have changed a lot if we see now. So the thing is, how do we engage with the new, more dynamic actors, the most dynamic actors in, in the world right now? Maybe you are, maybe, maybe you agree or not, but are the climate movement and the women movement. So the thing is that we shouldn't be talking about trade. We should be talking at, about what, as I said before, we have to talk about how illogical and irrational trade system is, that is the heart of the system. When you say change the system, not the climate, the banner of global justice now outside, we have to make people understand how trade is in the heart. Trade and investment regime are in the heart of the capitalist system, of, of the system that is like so wide and so abstract. We have to explain that because if we engage the climate movement, if we engage the feminist movement in the struggle against FTAs and, and investment regime, then you have the new momentum. Because it's not us talking to ourselves about oh, yes, how awful the system is. We already know that. The thing is, how do we give a new dynamic in this new moment when these are the, the, the movements that are actually out in the streets, saying things in Latin America, nothing can happen if the feminist movement is not there. So that is the thing we should try to approach those movements and tell them, do you know exactly how the trade agenda affects women? No, you don't, because you don't have the numbers. You don't even know how to. We know in, in theory, but it's time to actually go deeper into that. That is not easy. We need the people, we need the money for that. We need the new tools of communicating the impacts of trade and investment agenda. So it's always a new, uh, a new moment that we have to see, but we have to stop, like in football, in soccer, sorry. We have to stop the ball and analyze who are we talking to. And that is something that we should do, and I would really like ESU to be doing that, to have more spaces where we discuss strategy. I'm, I'm really unhappy that we don't have that in these three, four days we're together, but we have to see, well, maybe in the corridors is a space to start trying to strategize a bit. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, so go out, strategize in the corridors. Thanks to the interpreters. <laughs> and see you soon. Bye.